Hello, welcome to Undercover. I'm your host, Kevin Bousquet. Now, we're continuing on where we left off, where we have been talking about financial fraud. And I thought that it would be interesting today to actually talk about a fraudster, an actual example of a person who uh, committed fraud. Now, folks, imagine, if you will, a, a gentleman in his mid-20s who acts as a financial advisor in Toronto who manages to swindle $20 million from his clients while working as an investment advisor in the city of Toronto. Now, my guest today uh, wrote a book on this gentleman, and the gentleman that uh, the book is about is a gentleman by the name of Michael Holliday. And my guest is John Lawrence Reynolds, who followed this man's journey of his crime to the day that he was punished and convicted from the very, very end. Now, uh, a little bit about my guest. John Lawrence Reynolds is a well-renowned um, author. Uh, he writes crime writing stories. He publishes about two books a year. He has just completed his most recent books called Shadow People, where uh, he talks about his investigation into secret societies. And hopefully, if we have enough time, we're going to get into that. But uh, my guest is a, uh, um, has won the National Business Book Award. He's won the Arthur Ellis Award twice. Um, he was the president of the Crime Writers, uh, president of the Crime Writers of Canada, uh, past president of that organization, and he writes exclusively on financial and investment matters. Now, just to give you a bit of a background on my relationship with John Lawrence Reynolds, uh, when he was preparing the book on uh, Michael Holiday, uh, he contacted me to help him out with a very, very tiny little ob objective that he was trying to. Uh, accomplish in the book and I was uh, happy to help him and he gave me a little bit of a mention in the book which was much appreciated and we've kind of over the years very sporadically uh, kind of kept in touch so John welcome to the program good to see you Kevin now you know I'm looking at the cover of this book okay and I mean this guy to me looks like a little kid I mean, he, he looks like a teenager, and I realize he's in his mid-20s. How is it a guy this young manages to steal that much money from investors? Well, there were no real secrets, Kevin. It was Most of it, I think, was audacity. Okay. Uh, if you have enough nerve to do something, uh, to say something, to get people to believe you, uh, you can pull these things off, especially if you have trust. And, of course, the whole idea of financial advisors are that they have the trust of their investors. The other thing that uh, Michael Holiday had, especially in the second portion of his uh, swindle, was um, the, um, the support of a company uh, at the time, First Marathon Securities. When he went to First Marathon Securities, he was already earning a million dollars a year commission. He was not yet 30 years old. So he's already working for one investment company? He was company. working for Midland Walwyn at the time, which became Merrill Lynch. That okay. company is no longer here. Okay. Uh, he went from there to First Marathon, and he brought with him this reputation of being a pretty good producer. So he said, I want a title. I want an impressive title. And between the two of them, they worked out the title of Managing Director Futures Division. So he had business cards, letterhead a sign on the door that said he was a managing director of a substantial investment firm. And he used that to leverage uh, money out of his, uh, his clients by saying, look, I can set you up with something within First Marathon because I am a managing director. They carried a tremendous amount of weight. That's how he managed to carry out most of his frauds. And what's the nature of the scam? He's selling futures? Is that what it is? Well, he was supposedly in the futures division, but the fact is he was basically a pickpocket in an Armani suit. He did whatever it took, it took to get uh, money from his clients. And there are two aspects here. One is that he managed to um, ingratiate himself with one of the most respected investors in Toronto, one of the wealthiest families as well, a fellow called Doc Roberts, um, who, uh, who lived at 2 four Old Forest Hill Road here in Toronto. Um, he became, in many ways, Doc Roberts' surrogate son, the, the, the young fellow interested in the business that Doc Roberts was in that uh, Doc Roberts' sons weren't interested. And, and once he got that degree of trust, he managed through um, uh, what is called a, a check kiting, which is very difficult to do now, but was relatively easy to do 10, 15 years ago, 
uh, to to get his hands on $13 million of Doc Roberts' money. So is he telling people, look, invest with me, here's my reference, I've got this guy, Doc Roberts, who whatever... No, he didn't use Doc yeah. Roberts as a reference, he simply used whatever scam came across because he was very convincing. As I said, he had the audacity, he had the, the look, he lived very well, by the way. Okay. This, you cannot separate Michael Holliday Swindles from his lifestyle. He had a mansion in Forest Hill, he had a fleet of cars, a Jaguar, at one time a Ferrari, a number of other uh, cars, Mercedes-Benz. He uh, rented a, a cottage in an expensive area of, uh, of northern Toronto, north of uh, Ontario. He had beachfront property in the Barbados. He threw lavish parties. He threw money around as if it was um, uh, confetti because, frankly, that's what it was. It was all, all stolen money, It correct? was all stolen money. Okay. Now, um, what I don't understand is, so he's, he, what is he, I don't understand, he, how is he contacted, where do these clients come from? Well, some of them came from cold calls. Keep okay. in mind, now, he came out of, um, uh, out of British Columbia. He was, he was raised in a, a quiet town called Revelstoke, British B.C. Okay. Came to Toronto because that's where the money was, essentially. And he, I think, from the outset, was determined to make himself wealthy by hook or by crook, and that's exactly what he did. So he obtained a securities trading license, and that gave him entry into, um, into the, the financial investment market where people are looking. Keep in mind now that the investment market works on two factors, okay? It's, uh, it's greed and fear, okay? You, you, you fear that you're going to lose money. You fear that you're not going to have enough money in the future. You're greedy because you want to maximize that as much as possible. And uh, Holiday paid played on both of those, especially the greed aspect. He could say it. As a matter of fact, there was a, a connection here. I met him before the everything came crashing down, and I was told at that time that Michael Holliday could take $5,000 of my money and turn it into $10,000 in a couple of months with no risk at all. Well, I knew he couldn't, and most people know he knew he couldn't, but people wanted to believe that he could. And if, in fact, he did, he did um, generate returns that were that impressive, uh, they told their friends, and pretty soon everybody wanted in on the. Okay, on the but I mean, license. you know, if I'm investing with a guy like this, and I see that he's got this, you know, well-known, reputable investor letterhead on there, I'm going to think that it's a pretty safe of course you trade. Are. You of know, course you so are. I mean, is there any way that these people could have seen the warning signs that they're going to get ripped off? Well, only the, uh, and if you speak to, as you know, speak to uh, detectives on the fraud squad or anyone experienced in this kind of uh, situation. Okay. Uh, the, the, the rule number one is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And all of these deals sounded too good to be true, but people wanted to believe it. If, if the, the viewers take away only one thing from this experience, and the readers of my book as well, of course, okay. it, it, it is that rule. Okay, if it's too good to be true, step away. Uh, the, the second rule is if you have to act now and you can't wait around to think about it, walk away as but, well. You know, I mean, most people, you know, like most of us trust our brokers. Like you've said that uh, he was with, sorry, two... two he was with, uh, with Midland Walwyn and First Marathon. Okay. Both of these companies I've heard of. I oh, mean, of course. I, they were I, substantial I, firms. These are not boutique operations. Okay. And did they take any responsibility for the fact that people had... Uh, lost money on the auspices, if you will, that he was working for these? Well, that's the second half of the reasons why, the two reasons I wrote the book. I wrote the book, obviously, because it was a fascinating tale. Okay. Here's this kid from uh, a small town in B.C. who becomes, within two or three years of getting his license, a million-dollar-a-year producer on Bay Street. Everyone says, wow, the kid's a genius. Nobody could figure out how he was doing it, but they didn't care. Okay. They didn't care because okay. he was bringing the money in. So that's the first aspect. The second aspect happens after everything begins to crumble and fall apart. Okay. And people come up to First Marathon in particular and say, uh, I had uh, $300,000 set aside for my retirement. I now have almost nothing because of what your guy did. I want my money back. And they essentially were told to get lost. Why, why is that, though? I mean, are, are they, is, is he not working as an agent, so to speak, um, under these companies? Well, of course he is. But, okay. but um, uh, the deals that he was doing with his clients were essentially off the books. Some of them were okay. through for his marathon. Many of them were something like this. For example, one of his schemes uh, was based around a, uh, a fictional mutual fund operation out of New York. And, uh, in fact, there is a very uh, highly reputable, very productive firm out of New York that he linked up with and claimed that he was now operating the, the Canadian version of it. Uh, First Marathon said, we didn't know about this. Of course, if they'd known about it, they would have slapped it down. But the fact is that he was carrying out this fraud, this uh, charade of uh, running a mutual fund out of 
their offices, supported by the fact that he was their managing director, and uh, obviously the investors said, you've got to be responsible for some of this. They did said, these, no, we're not. Sorry to interrupt you. Did these companies benefit from his commissions at all on, on this particular particular? On firm? that particular one, they okay. didn't, but on many others, they did. He was trading, for example, there's a story in my book, Free Rider, uh, that came out in the, uh, the trial, a very complex trial, that he literally made $1 million in one day of investing. Legitimately or Legitimately, fraudulent. legitimately. Okay. He, I mean, every now and then he'd get something very hot. So he, he made a billion dollars profit. And he went to the, um, uh, the president of uh, First Marathon Securities and said, gee, what do I do with it? And the president said, I think you should crystallize. I think, in other words, cash it in, put the money in the bank, you're ahead of it. He didn't like that idea. He wanted $2 million. So he literally took a long walk around the block, thought about it, decided to do something after lunch, came back after lunch, and the money was gone. Okay, that's what can happen in futures and options trading. So he lost in the market. Well, no, I mean, he, he had it, and then it was gone because he didn't take advantage of it. Wow. He didn't okay. use it. Uh, one of his defenses, by the way, okay. at his trial was he, that he wasn't a swindler. He was just a lousy investment investor uh, advisor. Okay. Now, when I read the book, you know, there's this part, you know, where he's living this lavish lifestyle. He's bought all of these toys. He's having these parties. But one day he starts crying and says, you know, the money's all gone, blah, blah. So what that's, caused the money to... Well, that's, that's the, uh, how I opened the book, as a matter of fact. I opened the book with him uh, walking down a, a hall and trying to desperately to build up enough nerve to tell Doc Roberts and uh, his daughter that the $13 million they thought they had that he invested with them was gone. Okay. And it was gone because of his bad investment. It was gone because it never really existed in the first place. And it was gone um, uh, because uh, he had he'd launched a, a complete uh, fraudulent activity. So how does he get pinched? How does it all start crumbling down? How does he get caught? So well, he got desperate then. This would be in uh, July 1994. Okay. And, uh, and the family said, in essence, pay us back the money, which is exactly what you would expect to do. They did not go to the police. They wanted Michael Holliday. They still believed he was a very successful investment advisor to find their $13 million and pay it back. And they began to seize his assets, his sports cars, his, his wife's jewelry, and so on, okay. until he would pay back the money. Where is he going to find $13 million? The only place he can find it is from his current clients. So now he launched a whole series of frauds based upon short-term loans paying enormous amounts of interest. So he's stealing from his existing clients to cover this one bad $13 million situation. Is that what's exactly. going on? Exactly. And he would come to you and if I were him and say, Kevin, I've got a deal through um, First Marathon. Uh, I can get you in on it. If you've got $200,000, I can guarantee you 10% within two weeks. Okay. Okay. So you say, boy, that's pretty good, $20,000. Okay, so you put it in my hand. I give it to the Roberts family to try to hold them off for a while. You come back to me in two weeks' time and say, uh, where's my 220? Now I've got to either hold you off, which is what he tried to do, or I go to somebody else to get the 220 from them with the promise that they... So this now we're into a Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. And you know what a Ponzi yes, scheme is. Yes, we discussed is. in a previous show, as a matter of fact. The pyramid scheme, yes. which is destined to collapse on its own weight. Right. Now, what about family and friends? Like, I know that he had his own clients. Now, did, did, did other family members get involved with this guy? And put this is the real tragedy of it. Okay. Um, uh, he married into a, uh, a very large, active, vibrant family. Not a wealthy family, but a solidly middle-class family. And he employed every device he could use to make contacts through the family, within the family itself, to trust him with their investments. And, of course, in every case, it all just simply collapsed. Okay, now you're talking um, in the book about a funeral that happened where he had agreed to, can you just elaborate? Well, well Michael, you see, this is something that, the, um, that you would recognize and, and fraud investigators recognize as well, is that um, uh, these fraudsters, they want to live well and they want others to see them living well. They're very lavish in their expenditures. And that they want, they want feedback from people. So Michael, whenever something came up, would say, oh, I'll, I'll look after that, I'll pay for it, I'll do it. A tragedy occurred a few months before everything came crashing down when Michael's sister-in-law gave birth to two babies who were uh, premature and, and simply were not, they were not going to live. One was stillborn, the other only lived for a month. Well, the family was shattered by this, as you can imagine, and Holiday said, hey, I'll look after this. I have a uh, burial plot at Mount Pleasant Cemetery. I will pay for the funeral. I will have them buried there. Of these babies? Of these babies. Okay. okay. Leave everything to me. And, of course, the family says, isn't this wonderful of good old Michael? Look what he's doing. He did that.